I bid you welcome to this webinar organized by the Belgian Foreign Trade Agency and its partners, the Federal Public Service of Foreign Affairs, Flanders Investment and Trade, AWEX and Hub Brussels. This webinar marks the release of the second part of our study, Impact of the COVID-19 Crisis on the Belgian Foreign Trade, which covers the entire year 2020. The COVID pandemics have changed the face of the world and our societies, no matter how advanced, have proven very vulnerable. The human tragedies experienced on a global scale, scale are striking and raise many questions about our way of life. The global economy was hit hard by the crisis, as was foreign trade. Today's webinar will focus on Belgium and how Belgian foreign trade has coped with the crisis. We will have the pleasure of welcoming as a guest speaker, Jan van Hove, Professor of International Economics at the University of Leuven, who will give us his insights on how long we can expect the, the effects of the crisis to last. We have a heavy agenda for the coming hour, but allow me to quickly brief you on a few practical aspects. First of all, the slides of the speakers will be shared. You will receive them by email and you will find them on our website as well as the study, which will be released immediately after the webinar. This webinar is recorded and the recording will also be uploaded on our website. In case you have a question for a specific speaker, you can put it in the Q&A, mentioning which speaker you address it to, and we will answer you in the briefest delays. Now to kick off the webinar, it is my pleasure to introduce Mr. Jan van Ove, Senior General Manager, KBC Insurance and Professor of International Economics at the University of Leuven. Professor Van Ove holds a PhD in Economics of the University of Leuven. He was also a Research Fellow of the University of Michigan, USA. He has a very wide range of professional activities and it would take too long to mention them all, but let me mention just a few. Professor Van Hove has been offering expert advice to the European Commission, the European Parliament, the World Bank, the Belgian government, and the Flanders and Brussels government. From 2017 to 2020, he was chairman of the Economic Council of the Federation of Enterprises of Belgium. He has also led numerous research projects in cooperation with the European Central Bank, the National Bank of Belgium, and various European universities. He was Group Chief Economist of the KBC Group from 2016 to 2020. In July this year, he was appointed Senior General Manager Insurance Products of KBC Insurance. Mr. Van Manhove, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much uh, for the invitation and welcome uh, to this webinar, I think, which is a very interesting topic. Um, and of course, uh, allow me to share with you a couple of thoughts in the, in the next uh, 15 to 20 minutes. Um, and when, when thinking about uh, the impact of uh, COVID-19 on international trade, I think the obvious question is, of course, for everyone, uh, is this a temporary effect or do we experience something today uh, which will have long-term implications? And therefore, I have chosen as a title uh, for my, uh, um, let's say, humble intervention, uh, long-lasting or everlasting, which is obviously a very important question, not only for policymakers, but also for businesses. Um, do we have to adapt to the situation as we observe it today in the global economy? Uh, or is this just an episode and will we probably forget what's currently happening uh, just in a couple of uh, months or years from now? Now, talk about international trade in a, in a crisis context, uh, obviously it always raises a more fundamental debate uh, about international trade. And among international trade economists, um, there's a long-standing debate whether international trade is a major economic phenomenon or a microeconomic phenomenon. Um, now, uh, answering that question is definitely not, not easy. And uh, But in general, I would say in regular times, in good times, I could say, there is a very strong focus on microeconomic underpinnings of, of international trade today. Uh, if you look, for example, at empirical research today, very often people are looking at uh, what is driving, for example, uh, company decisions and how company decisions will ultimately lead to export performance, may trigger certain import decisions and so on. During regular times, international trade is very often approached from a microeconomic perspective. 
a right to its own. But actually, in volatile times, um, actually, the macroeconomic dimension becomes very important again. Uh, and that's basically a point I want to make here uh, this afternoon. Um, the macroeconomic impact of international trade is very important. And obviously, there is an impact from trade, but obviously, trade itself is being impacted also by what's happening in the, in the global economy. Uh, and therefore, I would like to make a statement here that the COVID-19 period is an excellent case of international trade as a macroeconomic uh, phenomenon. And obviously, I think, therefore, my approach here today will also be very complementary to what's later on in the webinar, uh, where definitely a more microeconomic approach uh, will be taken to see what the impact is on the Belgian economy, in particular what is driving um, international trade development in the, uh, in the Belgian uh, exporters and importers at this moment. Now, uh, let me start, perhaps, the uh, COVID-19 crisis um, is obviously a crisis that we all know very well, uh, because we all experienced it. Um, and let me emphasize that this is an unprecedented crisis. And, and just to show you how unprecedented it was, uh, let me show you here the evolution in, in real GDP growth in the major Western economies uh, since basically 2007, 2008. And so what you see there at the beginning of the period, on the left-hand side of the graph, um, is what we uh, tend to call the great financial crisis. Now, it's not that great uh, uh, if you compare it to what, what happened in 2020 and, and continued happening actually uh, to some extent this year, and the COVID-19 crisis. And if you just look at what basically the downfall is in the economic cycle, well, it is definitely unprecedented what we experienced during the COVID-19 uh, crisis. Um, uh, on average, you could say that the negative impact on the economy was almost double from what we experienced during the great financial crisis. Now, there's a second reason why this is an unprecedented crisis. And that's actually what we are observing today, namely that there is a, an enormous recovery going on, a very speedy recovery. And you may remember the debate uh, that was also in the press, uh, but that's also more academics going on. Um, during uh, the downfall in the economy, like what will follow? What will be next? And will it be a, an O-shaped economy uh, recovery, uh, a W-shaped recovery, V-shaped recovery? Well, actually, if you look at the picture here just in front of you, uh, you clearly see that uh, it definitely became a V-shaped recovery, even even more than a V, you might say, uh, because there is really the recovery that is taking place today is even exceeding the downfall in the economy uh, that uh, all economies in the world experienced uh, last year. So, an unprecedented crisis uh, from an economic point of view. Um, now, what does that imply for uh, international trade? Well, actually, as a matter of fact, international trade followed that business cycle uh, almost precisely. Uh, again, if you look here at um, international trade, the international trade monitor uh, uh, published by the um, by the, the Dutch the Dutch uh, well, federal planning agency, basically, um, you see that there was a clear downfall in 2020. Um, Contraction in international trade was even bigger than contraction in the economy. That's the typical feature of international trade. You very often see um, much larger swings in international trade than you see in the economy as a whole. But also the recovery was uh, much more explicit and even much bigger uh, than what we have seen in the economy. And that explains, of course, what we observe today that you have a, a very, um, yeah, very resilient economy but an even more resilient international trade sector and leading to the strong export performance performer, performance uh, by exporting firms, um, a strong import demand and by, by consumers, by firms in general. Uh, and obviously that is leading to a couple of challenges today. As challenges, uh, where again, uh, if we ask ourselves whether these challenges are temporary or whether they uh, have a long lasting impact. Now, perhaps uh, if you go a little bit more into detail, uh, what is also interesting to notice in this episode of the COVID-19 crisis from a trade perspective is that the, the hit on, um, on international economies uh, was not equal. And that's what you see here on the left-hand side. If you look at global goods exports, that's an index for a number of countries, advanced economies as well as emerging markets. Well, you see basically at the end of the period, um, in some countries actually, exports remained rather stable, uh, while in other economies, you see that there was a clear downfall. Uh, just to give, you, to give you an example, for example, um, you had the pink line on top, uh, that's India. And now we all know that India was hit severely by the COVID-19 crisis. Well, you also see that um, there was a clear downfall in Indian exports uh, as a consequence of that. Um, 
Eh? You could say, well, another example, for example, just, just to pick out one, eh, is, for example, uh, Chile, which is the red line here, then you see, for example, it was a country that was much more stable in terms of trade evolutions. Eh? So you see, you see different kinds of evolutions. Now, if you then look at the uh, recovery period, that's what you see on the right-hand side, um, what is really striking is there is a very st synchronized trade recovery. So, so basically it means everywhere in the world you see that exporters are recovering, um, at least at the country level, and obviously not, not for all firms. And, but you see in general there's a very strong international tendency um, going into a recovery phase at this moment, um, uh, which is basically reinforcing. And because, of course, if our exporters are, are performing well, and typically, of course, it triggers demand right, from other exporters in other countries, and especially for uh, open economies like, like the Belgian economy, that that's a very important feature. Uh, it drives both our exports and imports. They really go hand in hand. Now, uh, obviously, this causes a little bit of, of tricky things, uh, not at least for logistics, uh, not at least also for, for, for the policy surrounding everything. Um, and what we do see uh, in terms of logistics is that there is an enormous pressure on, on the container trade um, to make sure that this enormous recovery uh, is being facilitated by container shipping. Um, and you, you do see here on the left hand side, if you look at container uh, tr um, throughput index, and it's measure economic activity in that sector and that it, it was really an enormous upswing uh, which, which basically immediately leads to a uh, level of container business which is exceeding the uh, the pre-crisis uh, periods and so basically puts a lot of pressure on those logistics um, that's essential of course to enable global value chains to to, to be restored and uh, maybe more than what they used to do in the pre-crisis period on the other hand of course you need an openness in the economy, an openness in the economy, meaning that all the stringencies that had been installed because of the COVID-19 sanitary crisis uh, basically are gradually disappearing. And that's indeed what you, what you observe in many economies, and which you see on the right-hand side is the policy stringency index of the University of Oxford. And you see that, uh, generally speaking, you see a tendency of, of uh, reopening the economy and basically lifting all the sanitary measures that have been implemented before. It's a gradual move. You see, it's still a, there's still a long uh, way to go. Um, now, obviously, if you see that things are getting better, um, it immediately translates also in more confidence. And you see an, an extremely strong recovery in confidence, business confidence, uh, which you see here on the left-hand side for the industry and yeah, for a number of Western economies, the, the bold line uh, in blue, that's the euro area, and where you clearly see that there was not just a, a restoration of confidence uh, to, let's say, levels that we had before the, the, the COVID-19 crisis, but no, we see now uh, maybe an overconfidence uh, everywhere in the economy and that basically enterprises are saying like, look, uh, crisis is over, now it's time uh, to grow and to boost our activity. Now that confidence is a little bit in contrast with what, with what we see as on the right hand side, um, which is an illustration of the fact that consumers ultimately remain very cautious. And a typical measure for that is the number of car registrations, passenger car registrations. And why is that a good indicator? Because people only buy a new car if they are sure that the crisis is over and that the situation will be normal again in the next few years. And you clearly see that the number of car registrations definitely recovered, but it's not yet back at the pre-crisis levels. And so basically it means that people are still hesitant, people are cautious, um, and so the confidence that we see in the business environment is, is, is definitely much more optimistic than um, the, the more, let's say, cautious, less optimistic behavior that we observe among um, people. Now, why do we have these large swings eh, in the economy, but more in particular in international trade? Uh, I think the first reason for that is the fact, of course, actually we're talking about recovery, but this is not a recovery. Actually, this was not a crisis. This was a standstill in the economy. We closed the economy. And we closed it because of sanitary reasons. Uh, it was not that, the, that there was economic damage, that there was an economic problem. We just closed the economy, and afterwards we reopened the economy. So obviously, if you just reopen everything, um, all the, the capacity is still there. And your, 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 your factories are still there. Your people are still in the labor market. So this reopening uh, definitely helped. Um, it's very speedy recovery, as we call it today. 
Secondly, and we definitely observe after this COVID-19 crisis that the international economy is very resilient. And despite the fact that you close down the economy, that you basically cut um, global value chains, uh, there's an, an, an unprecedented disruption. You, see, you still see that these international trends, these international connections, uh, is extremely resilient. And you see that things are being picked up immediately again. A third reason why we had these large swings is definitely because there were shock mitigating policy initiatives. And which seems a little bit at all to say, you could say, well, actually, if you mitigate the shock, you would have less swings or more limited swings. But actually, the way in which we were mitigating shocks in a situation which was economically speaking not that bad actually led to a very large upswing in the aftermath of the COVID 19 crisis. And then finally was the enormous policy stimulus, unprecedented stimulus. Um, let me let me open, let's say, go a little bit deeper into some of these topics. And so first of all, uh, what policymakers did during the shock, and rightfully so, uh, they tried to mitigate the COVID-19 shock. Uh, two examples here. First of all, uh, in most countries, um, uh, politicians tried to avoid uh, bankruptcies. Uh, for example, in Belgium, basically, uh, the, from uh, basically, the legal procedures had to become bankrupt were basically interrupted. So it was not possible to become bankrupt for a while. Um, in other countries, basically, uh, the, the government uh, basically acted upon uh, the situation with, with other measures. But generally speaking, you see that the number of bankrupt bankruptcies never went up dramatically. And for example, you see in your figures for the US and for Germany. Uh, in the US, basically, you see almost no upswing, basically, no upswing in number of bankruptcies. In Germany, there was a bit of upswing, but it was really very temporary. Secondly, as we all know, uh, governments intervene a lot in the labor markets. Uh, we had temporary unemployment schemes uh, that were being introduced. Um, definitely in the European economies, there was no, no big upswing in, in, in the unemployment figures. In the US, there was an upswing, yeah, but it was very temporary. As you can see, it was really at the beginning of the lockdowns in the US that you had an upswing in unemployment rates, uh, but then uh, immediately the labor markets uh, recovered uh, and, and very rapidly again. And so basically it means that this is a very nice signal of uh, yeah, an economy that was in a standstill phase, but then reopened uh, and could immediately, immediately uh, perform very well. The second element hey, is the policy stimulus. And let's not forget that we are really experiencing a period where, where we have a combination of um, policy stimulus on the monetary side as well as on the, on the fiscal side, which has never, we have never seen that before in history. And we all know that interest rates are very low. And another example of how monetary policy is stimulating the economy uh, is by basically uh, uh, bond purchases which are being done by all major central banks in the world and which you see reflected here in the size of the balance sheets of the central banks. Uh, so the European Central Bank, Federal Reserve in the US, the Bank of Japan in the US, in, in Japan, uh, basically they all are buying government bonds in particular, also some commercial paper. And basically by doing so, they bring down long-term interest rates. So they give a, an enormous stimulus to the markets, um, to, to companies, to businesses, to invest. Them to, to restart their activities. And then on the other hand, as we all know, governments have been very generous too. They've been very generous to support people during the crisis, but also had to have more structural investments, recovery plans, resilience plans, and so on uh, in the aftermath of the COVID-19 crisis. Obviously, the, the downside of that is that the credit to general government, basically that's government debt, public debt, uh, is increasing uh, globally. And you see that here for the advanced economies, for emerging markets, but also for the world as a whole. And maybe just to give you one figure in particular, the world as a whole basically has a has a public debt ratio of 100% at this moment. And so clearly the world is in debt. Of course, you feel immediately that this, this raises questions about the sustainability of the situation, and in particular, how governments will basically move away from that kind of excessive policy. So basically, all of this uh, shows a world uh, where there was a strong crisis, but then also a very quick recovery. Nevertheless, we see distortions uh, popping up. Um, I want to focus on a few things here, uh, which are important from a trade perspective. First of all, um, there is, a, I think, still a debate ongoing whether the COVID-19 crisis was a demand shock or a supply shock. Uh, you could say, well, yes, it was a supply shock, basically because we closed factories, for example. And basically, there was no supply anymore. Uh, but on the other hand, also demand shock. Because we didn't allow people 
go outside, go shopping, uh, for example. And so basically, probably it's a combination of the two. Nevertheless, what we do see is that the stimulus that we provided uh, is definitely providing a very strong uh, stimulus to demand. And basically, we want people to consume, we want people to invest, companies to invest, because that leads to recovery. Uh, and that leads, obviously, also to a pickup in global demand and to imports and exports. Secondly, there is inflation. Um, and that's why I started uh, my presentation by saying like international trade is ultimately a, a bigger economic phenomenon because what we see today is that the inflation level is picking up um, in all major economies. Uh, what you see on the right hand side, for example, for the US, that's the red line, and where inflation is now exceeding 5%. And knowing that uh, central banks mostly aim at an inflation level of about 2%, having 5% definitely is an excessive inflation uh, figure. Um, now, we do see that in Europe as well, not, not, that, not to the same extent, huh, but also in the euro area, we see inflation levels uh, exceeding 2%, going into 3% and, and so on. Also in the UK, you have that. Um, and an important element there is definitely we are feeding each other's inflation figures. And because through international trade, when prices go up, well, obviously, uh, also imported goods become more expensive, adding to our own inflation. And so you have strong international price transmission mechanisms. Then a third element, and of course, the global value chains, and where, where the key question is that do we have temporary distortions or do we see a structural reshaping here? But let me go a bit deeper into that as well. And how long basically this effect will last. So just to illustrate uh, that we have a demand overshooting effect today, um, let me show you perhaps two, um, two figures here. And first of all, on the left hand side, you see the trade volumes of the euro area, the exports and imports. And where, of course, we have seen the downfall during the COVID crisis, and you have a recovery phase. But you see that the recovery actually uh, was overshooting and basically was larger than the downfall that we observed uh, just a couple of months, months before. And what's then the consequence? Well, if an economy overreacts, of course, you see a downfall. And even today already, you see that, well, though uh, exports and imports at the European level are still uh, doing, doing drastically, um, you see that things are slowing down. And so basically the economy is restoring and is going back to a more normal situation already. So you have this overshooting effect. If you compare this across countries, uh, which we do here on the right hand side for China, the US and your area, you clearly see this effect in particular in China. And that's interesting. Why? Because of course China was the, okay, the, the, the front runner in the COVID-19 crisis. It was a country which was hit first, uh, both from a health perspective and an economic perspective. It was also the country that escaped from the COVID-19 crisis uh, before any other country in the world. But again, you see that the Chinese economy uh, experienced this overshooting effect uh, at the end of last year, beginning of this year. While this year, you see that the, the Chinese economy is already calming down. And also, uh, the Chinese uh, export sector is calming down, I guess, which you see on the, on the green line here on the, on the right hand side. Now, talking about the inflation, um, and here I think the most fundamental question is whether we have a structural inflation upswing or whether this is a temporary one. If this is structural, uh, I think uh, definitely in Belgium, we are aware that this will have uh, well, tremendous consequences for wages and labor costs, production costs, and therefore prices, maybe for our competitiveness on global markets and so on. Now, Although we see, globally speaking, that there is a strong upswing in inflation, like 5% inflation in the US, uh, the situation in Europe is much more, um, let's, say, let's say, more limited, uh, less excessive, uh, with an inflation level that is exceeding 2%, but not too, too much. Uh, uh, now, what is important is the distinction between the headline inflation, which is basically the total inflation, and the core inflation, which is basically the inflation without the oil prices, energy prices, also excluding food prices, for example. Now, as you can see here on the left-hand side, the core inflation, which is this light blue line, uh, remained relatively stable in recent months, um, past two years. So basically, it means that the inflation pressures that we see here today is, are very much driven, in particular, by oil prices, energy prices, which you see here on the right-hand side. And that's, of course, not a surprise, because what happened during the COVID-19 crisis, well, basically, oil prices collapsed. They collapsed, and so they, they went down at extremely low levels. Then, of course, once these oil prices recover, 
because there is a renewed demand for oil, for energy in the global economy. And of course, the price difference between uh, the, the very low price level and higher or normal price level is enormous. And that is basically feeding um, the inflationary cycle today. This is not permanent. This is not structural. This is a temporary factor. Um, it's basically just driven by this disequilibrium in the market so that we are overstimulating the economy through fiscal monetary policy, uh, leading to a high demand for oil, leading to higher prices. So sort of the good news is basically that this is not structural and that this is a temporary situation. On global value chain disruptions, I just want to show you one graph, which is which I took actually from a recent study by the International Labour Organization. Um, it was an experiment they did to see uh, what the degree is of imported input supply disruptions because of closures, for example, of factories abroad. And then you see indeed in 2020 that there was an enormous upswing uh, in these supply disruptions uh, across a number of countries, um, which immediately explains how how sensitive uh, all economies are to what's happening in other markets and so once hey, because of our global interconnections and uh, once something happens in one country it immediately transmits into uh, other economies in the world so um, again you see that this was a distortion but you also see that there's strong resilience uh, that even if there are distortions in global value chains um, this is a nice illustration to show that um, actually these global value chains are quite resilient and they return basically to uh, more normal regular situations another example of that is what we sometimes call a shortages economy that we have today and there are shortages of everything and there's shortages of woods there's shortages of plumbers there's shortages of everything basically if you're trying to renovate your house you know it's uh, on a daily basis um, two illustrations with data here that support basically the view is a number of truck drivers in the us and you think, well, why is this important well ultimately these are the logistics and what you really see today is despite the enormous recovery in the US economy, that the number of truck drivers is still far below the number of truck drivers in the pre crisis period, which used to be about 4.4 million uh, drivers. As so you see, we lack capacity. There's a shortage of drivers in the US economy. Uh, another example is the, the business delivery time. So, how long it takes basically to deliver something. Uh, and again, we, we all know that hey, if you order things today, uh, order a car, order uh, uh, something for to renovate your house, basically it all takes longer, it all takes a lot of time. Uh, again, these are signals uh, of shortages in the economy, feeding inflation on the one hand, but secondly, uh, also distorting, of course, a regular way of doing business. But all these things are obviously temporary. And you see that the adaptations just take time to adapt. Markets are adapting, and but just takes time. So basically, if I come to my conclusion, uh, the outlook uh, for the global economy and for international trade is pretty positive. It's pretty positive. In, in, a, in an economy which is being stimulated, uh, international trade will flourish, uh, both on the import side and on the export side. On the other hand, uh, yeah, we want to have this, this, this extreme things out of the market. And restoring this equilibrium just takes a bit of time. Takes a bit of time. We have to adapt. Firms have to adapt. And basically, they were closed. They had to reopen. They had to adapt to a different demand pattern. And that takes a little bit of time. Inflation, uh, disruptions in the global value chains are basically all signals of this disequilibrium that we are experiencing here today. But it will, it will be solved. Nevertheless, there are some risks that may cause long term effects. For example, there could be inflationary upswings. And these could come uh, not so much from uh, what is currently happening, but from yeah, perhaps wrong things as a reaction to what is happening today. For example, if businesses react to this by saying like, look, oh, there is scarcity in particular things. Well, let's not sell particular things anymore. Um, it could come from the wrong policy uh, reactions and saying basically, OK, let, let's let's try to block certain exports of products. Uh, let's keep things for ourselves and so on. So these kind of policy reactions, these could trigger long term um, in impact. But if we leave it to the market, basically, uh, we clearly see that everything is going back into these uh, equilibrium situations. Another risk is definitely also policy reversals that go too quickly. Right? We have excessive monetary policy stimulus, we have excessive fiscal stimulus, um, and we have to revert that, definitely, no, no debate about that, but we have to do it in a gradual way. Because if we do it too quickly, uh, obviously, this, this will distort markets again.
And then from a trade perspective, a uh, concern remains, of course, that we see permanent protectionist tendencies. Uh, despite the fact that Brexit is over, that Donald Trump disappeared from the White House, we still see in the global economy protectionist tendencies. And um, economies trying to protect their own interests. Uh, and that's obviously uh, always worrisome and might lead uh, to long-term effects. And then finally, uh, obviously, maybe debate for another webinar, but there are coinciding factors which also make certain things structural today. And there is a greening of the economy, which was definitely initiated in the European context, that we see more and more in the global context that the, the gradual greening of our production processes, of our products, of our services, and so on, uh, is definitely affecting the way we are doing international trade. And then finally, as always, there are geopolitical shifts. And definitely, I think in the aftermath of the COVID-19 crisis, we clearly see that a more assertive China uh, is trying to play a more dominant role in the global economy. And that is definitely affecting international trade patterns too. These are probably topics that we can cover um, in a different and future webinar. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Van Hove, for your very interesting presentation. Uh, I think we can certainly share your analysis that um, the COVID has led to an unprecedented uh, economic disruption. Uh, but at the same time, it's encouraging um, to observe the resilience of the international economy and to hear that uh, the outlook is positive, even if it will take uh, some time to recover uh, an equilibrium. And from the side of our agency, we hope to contribute uh, next year to some of the recovery, thanks to our Belgian economic missions and um, our contribution to the state visit. Um, and now we will um, have our next speaker who will focus on um, the case of Belgium. I would like to welcome uh, Denis Gijsbrechts, International Trade Econom Analyst at the Belgian Foreign Trade Agency, who will present the Belgian Foreign Trade in 2020. Dennis, the floor is yours. Thank you and good afternoon. We have just received a very interesting view of which direction the economy and trade might evolve in post pandemic. Right now, however, we are going to take a step back and look at the recent past of Belgium's foreign trade flows in 2020 and by extension, the world's. On the next slide, we see that um, we have an overview of Belgian exports and imports of goods in 2020. Uh, I think we can all agree on the fact that the coronavirus epidemic has been a shock to the global economy. In 2020, Belgium was unable to escape the impact of mandatory closures and other measures implemented by the government to try to reduce the spread of the virus. Uncertainty of the Brexit saga also had a negative effect on Belgium's foreign trade. During the past year, Belgium exported goods to other countries in the amount of 367.5 billion euros, which is a decrease of 7.9% compared to 2019. Imports fell by 9.3% to 346.5 billion euros, which is an even larger drop. Even though the COVID-19 crisis is sometimes compared to the 2008-2009 financial crisis, its impact on Belgian exports and imports is more limited. As a reminder, in 2009, exports decreased by 17.1% and imports by 19.8%, which is more than double the drop for 2020. On the following slide, we see that Belgium accounted for 7.7% of total EU exports of goods in 2020, making it the fifth largest exporter of goods in the EU. Compared with its neighboring countries, Belgium, Belgium's exports fell less sharply in percentage terms than those of Germany, Italy, Spain, and France. Belgium's better resilience compared to the aforementioned countries was mainly due to a smaller decline during the first lockdown. However, Exports of goods of the Netherlands declined less in percentage terms than those of Belgium. Belgium's position is slightly less positive when compared with Austria, Sweden, Denmark, and Ireland, which are four EU countries with a comparable export structure. This last country even, even managed to export more compared to the previous year due to the significance of pharmaceutical products in total Irish exports of goods. 
The next slide shows that Belgium also accounted for a 7.7% share in EU imports of goods in 2020, making it the fifth largest importer of goods in the EU. Much like for exports, Germany retained the top spot for imports with a share of 22.8%. Belgian imports of goods decreased more sharply in percentage terms than those of Germany and the Netherlands, but Italian, French, and Spanish imports were less resilient than Belgium's. Belgian imports of goods were also down by a, by a larger percentage rate than those of the previously mentioned EU countries with a comparable export structure. On the following slide, we see that in the European Union, um, pharmaceutical products was a sector that appeared to be immune to the health crisis. This was also the section that recorded the largest growth rate in Belgian exports of goods. The sharpest decline, not just in the European Union, but also in Belgium, was recorded in exports of mineral fuels. On the supply side, the oil war between Russia and Saudi Arabia in March of 2020 led to a strong fall in prices. Demand for mineral fuels was also down sharply worldwide during the March-May period, and this because of the restricted freedom people had at the time. By summer, oil prices slowly started to recover when countries came out of lockdown and OPEC agreed to a significant drop in the production of crude oil. The next slide shows that pharmaceutical products and mineral fuels were also the two sections of which imports displayed the largest growth and decline respectively. Um, I would just like to add a short explanation for the significant increase in textile imports we can see here. The reason for this was the fact that at the onset of the pandemic, European countries had an acute shortage of textile items, such as face masks and protective clothing. Since European countries did not sufficiently produce these items themselves, they were forced to import them from China and ends the 125.8% surge. On the following slide, we are given proof that Belgium held its own in the field of foreign trade. According to figures of the WTO, Belgium moved up from 13th to 10th place on the list of largest exporters of goods in the world in 2020, with a 2.4% market share in global exports. Belgium was also the 12th largest importer of goods worldwide in 2020, with a share of 2.2% of global imports, which is two places up from the previous year. The next slide shows that China remained the global merchandise exporter in 2020 before the United States. Its economy was the first to be affected by COVID-19 and after falling in the early months of the pandemic, Chinese exports of goods were already stabilizing during the second quarter of 2020 and then rebounding strongly during the third and fourth quarter. This culminated in a rise of 3.7% in China's exports for the year as a whole. On the following slide, we see that the United States was still the largest importer of goods in the world in 2020, with a share of 13.5%, despite large cutbacks in imports of energy products and vehicles and parts, while electrical machinery and appliances only declined by 2.5%, a strong demand for home electronics compensated for the falls in industrial machinery. Meanwhile, US imports of pharmaceutical products mainly those coming from Ireland, Germany, and Switzerland, increased by 8.8% in 2020, while purchases of gold and precious metals grew over 80%. The next slide shows that Europe remained by far the most important market for Belgium in 2020, with just over three quarters of Belgian exports. However, Belgian exports to European countries were 26.3 billion euros lower than in 2019. This was partly due to the decrease in exports to our immediate neighboring countries. Outside Europe, the balances uh, changed somewhat over the past year, as Asia was overtaken by the Americas, which in 2020 became the main destination for Belgian goods outside Europe. On the following slide, we see that European countries also remain by far Belgium's main suppliers of goods in 2020, accounting for just under three quarters of total Belgian imports. The 15.4% drop in Belgian imports of goods from non-EU European countries was partly caused by the decline in imports of mineral fuels from the UK, Russia, and Norway, 
When we exclude Europe, Asia remained Belgium's main trading partner for imports of goods with a 15.1% share. The next slide shows that despite the fact that total Belgian exports of goods in 2020 were 7.9% below their level from a year earlier, exports to China still increased by about 1.5 billion euros, which was partly because of the higher value for human vaccines, unrefined copper, and medicines in Belgian exports to this, to this country. Vaccines for humans and medicines also played an important role in the 1.3 billion euro rise of Belgian exports of goods to the United States. It was mainly exports to our immediate, our immediate neighboring countries that were hit hard. Combined, the value of exports to Germany, France, the Netherlands, and the United Kingdom, which in 2020 still accounted for half of total Belgian exports, fell by 21.9 billion euros combined. On the following slide, we see that the Netherlands, Germany, France, and the United States remained the top four suppliers of goods to our country in 2020. On top of that, they were also the four countries from where Belgian imports experienced the strongest decline in value terms. It was partly because of this that total imports of our country decreased by 35.4 billion euros last year. The 1.3 billion euro rise in imports from China was primarily due to the aforementioned need for textile items such as face masks and disposable protective clothing. The next slide shows that, as we mentioned before, pharmaceutical products and mineral fuels were the two product categories of which the value changed the most in both Belgian exports and imports in 2020. And on the next few slides, we will examine whether or not these two product groups also had a similar impact on foreign trade of our neighboring countries and of other EU countries with an export structure similar to that of Belgium. On the following slide, we see that despite the crisis, exports of pharmaceutical products evolved in a positive way, not just in Belgium, but in each of the countries displayed here. Germany remained by far the most significant exporter of pharmaceutical products in the EU, but the largest value increase in exports of this product group was recorded by Ireland. The next slide shows that mineral fuels were the category of which the value in both EU and Belgian exports has fallen the most in 2020. All the countries listed here displayed negative growth rates that ranged from minus 21.4% for Austria to more than minus 40% minus for Denmark, Italy, and France. This was partly due to the decline in boat, road, and air traffic, and also in industrial activity, and also in, because of the oil war between Russia and Saudi Arabia. On the following slide, we see that pharmaceutical products were not only the section of which exports in 2020 recorded the largest increase in both Belgium and the EU as a whole, but also of which imports displayed the most significant rise. In each of the 10 countries listed here, imports of pharmaceutical products were up, which boosted EU imports as a whole to grow by 24.5 billion euros. The next slide shows that Germany was still the number one importer of mineral fuels in the EU before the Netherlands and France, but collectively imports of mineral fuels were down by an astounding 190.8 billion euros in 2020 for the European Union as a whole. Each of the 27 EU countries posted a significant drop in imports of mineral fuels, which is why the share of this single group of products in total EU imports fell from 10.7% to 7.6%. Next slide, uh, right upon, upon uh, this point, we have extensively looked at the impact of the pandemic on trade and goods. But right now, we're also going to look at the consequences for trade and services. Belgian exporter services decreased by 5.8% in 2020 to 101.7 billion euros while total Belgian imports of services fell by 6.1% last year to 100.9 billion euros. On the following slide, we are given even further proof that Belgium did better than, than average in the field of foreign trade. As according to figures of the WTO, Belgium moved up from 14th to 11th place on the list of largest exporters of services in the world in 2020. Belgium was also the 11th largest importer of services worldwide in 2020, 
which is two places up from the previous year. Uh, on the next slides, uh, it is primarily travel and tourism sectors that have been affected in 2020 as flights were grounded, hotels and other tourism related services were closed and travel restrictions were being implemented throughout the world. Tourist arrivals suffered a massive drop of 74% in 2020 as destinations worldwide welcomed 1 billion fewer international arrivals than in the previous year. Nevertheless, the United States remained the number one exporter of services in the world in 2020 with 13.9% of world exports. Uh, the structure of international trade and services changed dramatically in 2020 with the share of travel nearly halving and digitally deliverable services gaining more prominence. The United States was still the number one importer of services in the world in 2020 with a share of 9.6%. Its imports, which were heavily affected by the collapse in travel and passenger transport, increased on an annual basis for insurance services, business services, and personal, cultural, and recreational services. On the following slide, we see the main categories in Belgian exports of services in 2020, and the lower value for travel and transportation services contributed significantly to the 5.8% reduction in total Belgian exports of services last year. As borders remained closed during the first lockdown and restrictions continued to be applied afterwards, a much smaller number of tourists and business travelers visited Belgium over the past year. The hotel occupancy was down and foreigners also spent less on meals and souvenirs during their stay. This contributed to the 27.4% decrease in revenues from town services in 2020. But not only did a significantly lower number of tourists and business travelers visit Belgium, but the number of tourists and business trips from Belgians abroad also decreased over the past year. Combined with the reduction in the transport of goods, this means that the value of the transportation services section fell by 6.1% to 20.5 billion euros. The next slide shows the same downward trend in Belgian imports of services as in exports. Expenditures, on, expenditures of Belgians on travel services abroad plunged by 30.2%, while the lower number of tourists and business trips from abroad to Belgium caused imports of transportation services to decline by 11.2%. On the following slide, we see that the fall of nearly 6.3 billion in total exports of Belgian services can partly be explained by the decrease in exports to France, the United Kingdom, and the United States. The top position in the ranking was still held by the Netherlands in 2020, with a share of 15.3% ahead of France and Germany, which took over third place from the United Kingdom. The last slide shows that Total Belgian imports of services decreased by more than 6.5 billion euros in 2020, which was in part due to reduced imports from France and the United States. 2020, the three main suppliers of services, just like for exports, were the Netherlands, France, and Germany. I hope that this, this presentation has given you some more insight into the impact of the pandemic on exports and imports and as to why foreign trade evolved in the way that it did. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dennis, for this very comprehensive analysis. And we can conclude that all by all, Belgium has done rather well in 2020, partly thanks to the prominence of uh, pharmaceutical products and vaccines in our foreign trade. So now we will welcome our uh, last guest speaker, last but not least, Mrs. Christelle Charlier, Director of Studies, Statistics and Communication at our agency. She will go through the main conclusions of the microeconomic analysis of the impact of the COVID-19 crisis on the Bel Belgian foreign trade, a very innovative uh, approach. Christelle, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mrs. Lowe. Thank you, Denise. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for, par par for participating at our webinar. So I will now present the second part of our study, which is a microeconomic analysis of the impact of the COVID-19 crisis on the Belgian foreign trade in 2020. 
As mentioned by Denis, you know that the Belgian export of goods decreased by 6% in 2020. Some chapters, like the pharmaceutical products, increased by 90.1%. In the second part, we aim to look at individual performances of exporting companies by considering the variation of their exports between 2019 and 2020. To fulfill this objective, the National Bank of Belgium provided us a sample of anonymous data from 3,794 exporting companies so that we could analyze the individual statistics following the national concept. A certain number of features were collected, like exports by chapters, by partner, but also some information from the central balance sheet of the bank. In our sample used in this second chapter, in this, just in, in this second chapter, the most important quarter of the exporting company represents 88.4% of the export. So we directly see that the biggest companies strongly influence the total variation of a particular sector. Could we therefore generalize the results of chapter one to the whole population? That's the question. And is the, re is the reality of big exporters the reality of smaller ones? That's what we are trying to answer in this second part. Before presenting the results, I would like to introduce, or for some of you, revisit the statistical concept of quartiles. Quartiles are a subdivision in four equally populated groups of statistical variables ordered by value. The first quartile is a threshold with 25% of the individual, and in this case, we speak about companies, are situated below. By asymmetry, the remaining 75% are situated above the threshold. The second quartile, which we will mention as Q2, is most commonly called the median. This is a central point. 50% of the individual, so 50% of the enterprises are situated below, and 50% of the enterprises are situated above. So you directly understand why it's called the median. And consequently, the third quartile is a threshold was 25% of the companies have performed higher. The concept of median offers the advantage to, con to cancel the effect of outliers. For example, a company whose export progress by, let's say, a thousand percent influences the mean, but not the median. As you are working with percentage of variation of export, the median is certainly a relevant central trend statistics. On the next slide, we'll see here the first result of this second part. This is the histogram of the variation of export between 2019 and 2020. As you can see, the median, which is Q2, equals minus 8.3% which means that half of the exporting companies perform therefore below and above a loss of 8.3% of their exports. You can understand that this result is more disappointing than the 6% global loss of the Belgian exports. This difference between the median and the mean variation of exports illustrates that certain big companies influence strongly the results. We can now go to the next slide. Uh, the next result focus on the chapters, the chapters in statistics, you certainly know that is the different category in the statistics, and um, here we were studying 98 uh, chapters. Um, and we, we will here only consider the most significant results. The most positive median comes from the chapter foods, as you know, the better, the best results were for the chapter uh, pharmaceutical products in the mean analysis. Half of the Belgian food exporters achieve results higher than a gain of 17.7%. In comparison with the mean gain reach only 6.5%. This is a, a very clear example that the reality of the small companies is not exactly the same of the biggest enterprises who define the global trend of the sector. As expected, the median of the exporter of pharmaceutical products is also positive. The gain is nevertheless limited to 
4.8% versus 90.1% regarding the global statistic for this chapter. So you see, small exporters in this sector didn't profit as much of the COVID-19 crisis as the biggest well-known companies. And there are three other uh, ch uh, chapters where the median was positive. It's pet food, vegetable products, and essential oils and cosmetics. On the right side of the slide, you will see the five lowest median, which is articles of apparel, precious stones and metals, tufted textiles, products of the printing industry, and man-made stubble fibers. On the next slide, you will see, the, we will focus on the median impact by partner. We have here selected the top 50 export partners from 2090 to avoid that small partners generate a non-significant high variation between 2090 and 2020. The first uh, conclusion we can see here on the screen is that all the figures are negative. So, uh, it, it's a decrease for all our partners, but the five best results are on the left side. And surprisingly, Taiwan is the most resilient destination. Um, so with Taiwan, 50% of the companies perform higher than a loss of 3.3% of their export. The global mean result was, however, uh, was ho however a gain of 30.2%. The biggest companies dealing with Taiwan have therefore taken more profit from the year 2020 than the smallest ones. And we have indeed identified which products were prefer especially performing good. It was the pharmaceutical products and the base metals. The other partners in the top five are European and close from Belgium. You see Netherlands, you see Germany and France, and the case of Denmark is more particular uh, the median equals minus 7.4%, while the global variation is plus 8.2% due to the positive evolution of pharmaceutical products. And the five partners whose median exports have the most decline are South Africa, India, Bulgaria, Singapore, and Algeria. On the next slide, we will have a look at the variation of exports in function of accounting criteria on December the 31st of 2019. Uh, could some accounting features be relevant to explain variation of exports? So we start with a first criteria, and this first criteria is the full-time equivalence. What appears on this graph? It appears, in fact, that the medium-sized level enterprises, you see the one uh, between uh, 200 and 500, um, have in certain measure better resisted to the COVID-19 crisis. And those, uh, those are the most impacted are the enterprises employing between 500 and 1,000 full-time equivalent um, their turnover abroad decreased by 15% in median, almost a difference of six points with the penultimate group, which so the big companies are here the most impacted. This is really clear in this graph. And then uh, we asked another question and we were wondering if the enterprises dependent on export were more affected by the COVID-19 crisis than Others. Therefore, we took the ratio between the export of a company and its turnover taxes excluded. What we see in this graph is that the companies dependent on exports between 5 and 10% are most resistant to the COVID-19 crisis this year. The second and third position of enterprises dependent on export between 50 and 75% and more than 75% is the most interesting information in this graphic. You see that half of these exporters lost at maximum respectively 6.4% and 7.6% of their turnover abroad. We can therefore conclude that the most dependent companies on exports have collapsed in 2020. Then on the next slides, we uh, study the profit margin. We defined it as the total operating profit or loss divided by the turnover. Uh, 
And here, very clearly, you see that the higher the business performance of a company in 2090, the less its exports decline in 2020. On the next slide, we were considering the depth as an indicator. So therefore, we took the ratio, the depth divided by the capital. And the main conclusion we can draw from this graph is that the most indebted companies characterized on the graph you see it by a rate of depth superior to 20% were by far the most suffering exporters last year. Eventually, on the last slide, we study the ratio of the reserves. We defined it like the reserved plus profit or loss carried forward divided by remuneration and direct social benefits. And we could consider this ratio as the ability for a company to support to reimburse its short-term, middle-term fixed costs given its results in export. We could notice that the first three groups whose ratio is higher than 100% record the lowest medium losses. At the opposite side, the enterprise without reserve, so with a negative ratio, presents all a medium variation of exports under the global median. It varies between minus 10.7% and minus 90.3%. For more information, I would suggest you can uh, consult or study, and therein you will find all the detailed information and the study of the different indicators. I thank you for your, your attention in this especially technical uh, matter. Thank you very much, Christelle, uh, for presenting this new angle of analysis of the impact of the COVID-19 crisis on Belgian foreign trade. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now time uh, to conclude our webinar. I would like to thank you all for your participation uh, today. And let me already announce our next uh, webinar, which will take place on October 12th at um, 3.30, and it will be dedicated to Belgian health technologies. Also, that webinar will be organized in cooperation with our partners, the Federal Public Service of Foreign Affairs, Pandas Investment and Trade, Alex and Hot Brussels, which we thank warmly for their cooperation in our projects. So thank you very much for your kind attention and have a nice day. See you next time. Bye-bye.